If you get halfway through an, ex an exponential innovation, halfway through there you're saying, whoa, I am doing something really bad, and you kill it because it's not performing like the other ones are. Um, it's okay, guys, don't worry. Um, and so, so you get trapped into that way of thinking. It's like, if you think about cars, I know um, Hod talked to you a lot about cars yesterday, but have you ever wondered why the cars all look the same? I mean, even if you have, you know, the most amazing uh, Italian automaker or a BMW or a Ford, they all basically look the same. There's some style. I know it's the sacrilege. <laughs> they don't even know the Ferrari. But, but they, 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 they all have basic components that are pretty similar. There's reasons for that, right? One is that the components used to make that car have to be interchangeable. Because when I go and I break down in some random place, that place needs to be able to easily fix my vehicle. Yeah? And when we do the manufacturing, we try to make it as efficient as possible and use as few suppliers as possible to get that car manufactured. But it's bigger than that. The ways we make decisions about which car should be on the road are the same way we make decisions about the last car that was on the road and the car before that. Because that's how we do business. But it's even bigger than that. The infrastructure of our roads. Do you know what size our roads, why our roads are the size they are? Yeah, because the horse-drawn carriage has to be able to go down that road. And that's how we have the width of the cars that we drive. That's how long that infrastructure has been in place. In addition to it, if you want to design a car, whether you're from Italy or Japan or from Germany or from the United States or from Mexico, you go to one of two colleges, one of two in the world. You either go to Center for Creative Studies, College for Creative Studies, which is where I went to school, or you go to Art Center. What am I saying here? I'm saying that all of that is creating a specific viewpoint on how cars should be made. And it traps us into thinking of those things as the best practices, as the rules of the game. And it prevents us from seeing outside of that expert viewpoint. Unfortunately, crazy ideas are what change the world. And we have this whole system in place to prevent crazy ideas from happening. Yeah? Before Thomas Edison came up with a light bulb, people ridiculed him. And it's not like it took him a day or two to come up with a light bulb. It took him years. That means for years people thought he was a crazy moron <laughs> for working on this thing. Florence Parapot, she didn't even buy the light bulb, she invented the right refrigerator. And when she was working on that, people were, thought she was ridiculous. First of all, she was a woman. How dare she? And secondly, she was trying to create a left refrigerator. Nobody needed that. They had ice boxes, they had larders. Why would they need a refrigerator? Now we can't think of life without these two. And it happens every time something novel is introduced into your world, right? When Facebook turn, changes the entry box into having curved corners, people lose their minds. Oh my god! But it's this kind of outlet, outlandish corner changes uh, that change the world, right? That's how we change the world. So, when you're an expert, how do you allow yourself the free fall of coming up with these wild, irrational ideas that would never work? for you in your existing businesses. How do you do that? Well, as for Teller from Google X, see, they're the people that brought you the self-driving car, and AlphaGo, and all these amazing breakthroughs. What he says is that shifting your perspective is better than being smart. And I love this. It's kind of like Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Does anybody remember Plato's Allegory of the Cave? No? Are we just really, really tired this morning? Yeah, all right, so Plato, Plato had an allegory that went something like this. Um, there are these prisoners, and they're locked up in a cave, and they're chained up so they're facing the wall of the cave, not the outside, but the wall, okay? And so all that they're seeing on the outside are these shadows that are walking by the cave's entrances. So to them, they think, oh my god, outside of here, it's all just shadow creatures. So they're terrified of the world outside. But one day, a guy is feeling brave, and he breaks out, and he runs to the surface. And when he gets there, he says, oh, wow, there's trees, there's grass, there's flowers, there's birds, there's other human beings. This is amazing. And he runs back to the cave, and he tells his friends, and they don't believe him. 
They think he's lying. They think they're tri he's tricking them into dying. And so they, they stone him to death. Um, <laughs> which I hope doesn't happen to you. Um, but the point of the matter is, is that just by looking at the world from another angle, from seeing things from a different perspective, you naturally find new opportunities, new ways of thinking about the world that can help you to move past that expert mind lock that you get into and allow yourself to see the world from a novice point of view, which is exactly the type of people that are going to disrupt you. The disruption is not going to come from within the building. It's going to come from somebody who does not care about your 200 years of uh, history as a company. They does not care about the way things are done in your industry. They're going to be people that have no idea about that. And so they don't worry about making rules because they aren't even aware of the rules. So in order to be able to do this, you have to be able to shift your perspective to see the problem that you're working on from an entirely different angle from that of which you look at it now. So you have to shift yourself. And that's exactly what Design for Exponentials has been created to do. Design for Exponentials is um, a series of shifting frameworks to allow yourself to see the problem from different points of view in order to generate massive, transformative, say it with me, exponential innovation. Yeah? And it consists of four different phases. I'm going to talk to you about three of them. The first one is to discover the real problem. We get so comfortable in the problems that we're solving that we take for granted that we know what problem needs to be solved. And if we are, um, if we're following design thinking, a lot of times what we do is we look at our existing user base or at the existing data and we say, there's a problem here, we should go solve it. And usually it's a problem that we know we have because we have the data around it. Unfortunately, that's probably not a real problem. That's a business problem. That's not a needs problem. So you need to spend time to really think through what the problem is. Einstein said that if he had an hour to change to save the world, he would spend 55 minutes figuring out what the real problem is. Because then the solution is obvious. And it's true. I see it happen over and over and over again. So for discovery, we think it's really important for you to really look at the problem and see it, not from your business perspective, but from the actual people that are being impacted from it. And the fact of the matter is that you are not going to figure it out from here. Okay, you can't figure it out in a boardroom what your problem is. You're not going to be able to find it in the data. You have to get up off of your chair and go to the place where it's at and look at it for yourself. Yes, even you have to do that. Not just some uh, designer down at the end, but actually you have to go and look. You have to immerse yourself in the problem. So a lot of design thinking is based on um, empathy. Uh, this is a very traditional design thinking methodology. And this is a woman here, it's called Patricia Moore. She's, um, she's one of the gurus over at IDEON. And what she did was really interesting. She wanted to work with senior citizens. And so, uh, she, she was a young woman at the time, she was in her 20s, this was back in the 30s. She was in her 20s, and uh, she decided to do something radical. So she, that's her, actually, on the left. She dressed herself up as an elderly lady, actually multiple elderly lady, and went through a day in the life of these people to see what was different about that. And she created some massive breakthrough findings that they were able to leverage to create very simple solutions for this demographic of people. So you have to immerse yourself as much as you can. Maybe you don't want to play a costume and dress up. It's okay. You can just go there and pay attention. And then we want you to listen to other voices. Many times when we try to solve a problem, we bring in all the experts. All the people that have solved that problem before us, that know everything about them. But like I said, those are the people that are telling you how it can't be done. We don't want to listen to those people. We want to expand the conversation. I, I work in technology, and I am so often the only woman in the room. It's shocking. Just by inviting different people into your meeting rooms, 
or even talking to people from different generations, you'll be able to, um, to, to uncover new insights that you very easily, just by expanding the conversation to include other people. My, my uh, monitor is not crazy up here. Um, but you need to work on a big, meaty problem. You can't do massive innovation trying to think of a, a new pair of shoes, right? Like it, that's, that's not how it's going to do. If you're, if you're a banker and you're trying to think of a better way um, to, to uh, manage a bank account, that's not going to necessarily lead to massive innovation. That's an iterative solution. You're trying to solve something that exists now to fix it. You have to instead work on a really big problem. And working on impact in particular will unlock all kinds of new opportunities to help change the world. There are so many to choose from. We have 13, but here's just a few. You can work on global farming. You can work on the population. You can work on poverty, sanitation, water, literacy, malnutrition. All of those need solving. And while it seems a little foreign to you right now, you're like, why is she asking me to solve a little hunger? What you find is that by working on these problems, there's not a lot of other people working on them. Not specifically, not from your point of view. So when you work on them, you develop massive IP that you wouldn't be able to find in any other place. IP by IP, I mean intellectual property, yeah? And that's incredibly valuable. Take, for example, these guys. Anybody know what this is? No? Okay, so back in the 80s, a company called SRI in, in Silicon Valley, those are the people that brought you the Siri, yeah, uh, sort of the Stanford Research Institute, they were working on helping deaf people to use phones to communicate. So they're deaf, obviously they can't hear. They need to do something else. And so they decided they were going to try to figure out how to help deaf people send data packets over phone lines. And then in 1994, when we decided that we wanted to commercialize the internet, we said, oh, how are we going to do this? How are we going to send data over phone lines? Hmm. And these guys were like, oh, we have this. It's called an acoustic modem. And for those of you old enough to remember, this is the whole reason we have the internet. This is the thing that went, yeah. it's this. So they worked on this problem. They helped a bunch of deaf people to communicate, and oh, by the way, they unlocked the internet for millions of people around the world. In this space, you find collaborators, not competitors. So rather than finding other people that want to elevate you out of the way or keep you out of the conversation, you find people that are so willing to help, so willing to contribute to your development of solutions. You also find massive amounts of funding from grants, from philanthropic organizations, as well as other corporations that are willing to solve these problems. And then you also, oh my goodness, sorry about that. And then you also come out with something that people love. People want to support companies that do good in the world. And they become stubbornly loyal to you if you can prove that you are doing real good in the world and not just marketing love. Yeah? All right. So that's discover. The next step in the phase is to project. We use a little bit of this today. Project the future. We like to use science fiction to do this because science fiction influences science back, back and forth again, over and over and over again. Right? Gene Boddenberry uh, from Star Trek, he created this communicator, and the guy from Motorola. He saw them and said, I need that in my life. I want that in my life. And so he built an entire company called Motorola to go out and build exactly that. And that's why we have the clown phone. And this is a massive breakthrough for cellular technology. Yeah? And it, what happens is, is that science fiction writers, they read the white papers that I and my colleagues are creating, the science papers. They get all excited and they're like, ah, oh, that could be this, that could be this, that could be this. And they write these. Um, books, okay, you make movies or tell stories about how the future could be. And then geeks like myself, we read that and we go, oh, I wonder if we can make that for real. 
And then we go back to our labs and we prove out the science fiction and we create science fact, which then inspires more science fiction, which then influences my, my science fact and back and forth and back and forth. It happens all the time, right? How? Does anybody recognize how? Space Odyssey 2001? It was not the nicest uh, artificial intelligence. Try to kill everybody, but it is exactly that that led uh, Steve Jobs to create Siri. Right? That's why we have Siri. It's how. Oculus, people that are working on Oculus Rift, that's the VR headset being developed at Facebook, each and every one of them is handed a copy of Ready Player One. It's a novel and now a major mystery picture. Depicting a world where we prefer to spend our lives in virtual reality, and they're being told, build that. That's what we want. Go build that. And so they are. Star Trek, this guy again. I think Star Trek, can anybody watch Star Trek? Uh, I'm always curious because like half the room never sees what I'm talking about. Alright, so this is Dr. McCoy. And do you remember that little um, doohickey he would use? He'd be like, dee -dee -dee -dee, and he'd know what was wrong with somebody. It's called the tricorder. Well, Qualcomm and uh, Diamantis' X Prize put out a challenge for somebody to actually create it, and they did. Yeah, they created it. It's called the, the, the Death Star, um, and it uh, can diagnose 10 different diseases, 10 different common household diseases. Right? So we can leverage science fiction to generate science facts that can change the world. And the best way to predict the future is, of course, to create it yourself. And so that's what we do at SU. We use a methodology called Science Fiction Design Intelligence. It's a really um, exciting thing. Where first we spend um, several days immersed in the different technologies, talking to different technologists, like you heard from the other yesterday, as well as many more, trying out different uh, prototypes and demos. This is my good friend, Divya Chandler, and Nick Khan, and, and she's put some sensors on the outside of the brain, and she's showing him that he can read her thoughts without him even realize that she can read the thoughts. Scary. Anyways, and then we work with science fiction writers and comic book illustrators and movie um, movie writers and uh, crazy, crazy people like myself. And uh, we generate stories. And then we tell these stories. We, we create comic books and other things to be able to share the story with other people. Because when we do that, it helps us to suspend disbelief. By creating a vision and a narrative that we can all share, it helps you move beyond your expert point of view and create a, a narrative about what you want the future to be like. And then you can share that narrative with other people and help them to suspend disbelief, which is way more powerful than you might imagine. Because something really interesting happens when you're trying to express a crazy idea, right? The knee jerk, like I said, is no. No, not that. And so the more you can familiarize people with the idea and make it seem normal, the more likely it is that they're going to be able to get on board. The other thing that it does is it helps you to, um, instead of imagining what I'm talking about, it gives you something to respond to. So you're responding to the actual idea, not whatever you're interpreting that idea to be. Let me give you an example. When I say the word robot, what do you picture in your head? Everybody pull up a picture of a robot. Got one? How many of you saw a humanoid robot? How many of you saw an industrial robot? How many of you saw a Roomba? Right? So if I were to say to you, hey, we need to put a robot in that store, if you saw a humanoid robot, you might be like, yeah, that sounds great. If you saw an industrial robot, you'd be like, what? Why would we do that? Right? Like it, it totally changes depending on what you're picturing in our head. And we could be arguing for days and hours and weeks, and the idea could be killed just because we have a different picture in your head when I say robot. That seems trivial. So by creating something that we can both look at and say, oh, that's what you mean. Oh, yeah, okay. That helps us. And then in doing that, we learn what to build today. Because if that's the future that you want, if that's the wild and crazy, irrational future that you want to create, you can work backwards from that date and say, in order to do that, I have to accomplish this by that date, and this, and this. And then you can see how easily you can create stepping stones to that future that you want to create. Because Astro Teller, my, my hero there from X, he also said, if there's any future in which you can envision that solution existing, 
You need to start building it right now. And he's true. He's true. That's, that's why Google do, does what Google does. Okay? It's because if they can see a future where self-driving cars exist, they have to start building them now. That's how they work. Okay? Let me give you an example. So this is Made in Space. Made in Space is another SU company. They're pretty awesome. I highly recommend you check them out. Um, Bryce in the back there, he, he's very good friends with Jason. Uh, they went to school together. So, uh, Made in Space does something interesting. They wanted to colonize Mars. And in order to do that, they realized, you know what, in order to do that, we're going to have to have buildings on Mars. So how do we start building buildings on Mars? Well, okay, so the way that we do that now is we build them here on planet Earth. That means it has to have Earth materials, respond to Earth gravity, and remember how I said that our roads are the size of horse-drawn carriages? In order to ship the in order to ship the building to other space, it has to fit on a truck that can fit on a road designed by horse-drawn carriages. So now we're creating this out this structure in outer space, and we're basing it on a, a technology, horse-drawn carriage, that nothing else. I never see a horse truck carriage on the street, have you? I mean, it's that outdated, but still it has to be part of it, right? So that's that framework I was telling you about. We get blind to it, we don't even see it. And then on top of it, it has to be a light enough payload that it can be launched into outer space, which is its own problem. So maybe space said, that's silly, we're not doing that. We're going to manufacture it in outer space, because we can do that. And then they were like, okay, well, if that's the future we want, how do we get started? And he guesses what they did first. Oh, I'm going to need to talk. Um, they built the first... I had it. I had it. You saw it, right? There. They put the first uh, 3D printer on the International Space Station. That's what they did. And so in doing so, they're learning all kinds of amazing uh, uh, things about what it means to disrupt an entire supply line. Because now, um, in order, if, a, if an astronaut needs a tool in outer space, rather than having to wait six months for a payload to come from planet Earth, they can just ask, a file gets sent, and they open their magic box, and that's what they call it. They call it their magic box. They love this thing. And the tool is sitting there. They are amazed, right? And so, um, but maybe in space, what they're doing is they're getting valuable ID around that, as well as when you're in outer space, you have to be able to recycle the parts. You have to deal with um, toxic gases because you can't kill people on the International Space Station just because they want to start. Yeah? So they're learning all this valuable IP that they're applying here on planet Earth just as much as they're learning how to manufacture in outer space. So that's Project. That's a really powerful tool. So that's one that I'm going to talk to you about is Make. And this is one of my favorites. I'm a very physical person. So making is incredibly important. This is the prototyping part of our process. Um, and, and more than anything, making helps you to think. Yeah? Because um, instead of, well, because we as humans, we don't just sit and think, right? That's, that's not really how our brains work. It's not some disembodied mind floating around inside our brain telling our bodies what to do. We actually embody our brain. Our minds are embodied, right? If you're stuck on a problem and you can't figure it out, you go for a walk and suddenly you can't, yeah? When we try to teach kids how to do math, if we can show them to use their hands in the process, they're twice as likely to learn that uh, lesson. So the more physical you can be in your thinking process, the more productive your thoughts become. Okay? The other thing is that it changes your tools automatically. Instead of reaching for your PowerPoint to start to put the idea together, you start using different tools. And the more basic you make your tools, like cardboard and glue and tape and all that kind of stuff, the more you engender a sense of play into it, because it harkens back to your childhood and play, which is so healthy for your imagination. So it helps you to think in that way. And then it also helps you to explain so this is the prototype that I built uh, while working on the HoloLens at Microsoft. And um, I was trying to explain this 
in, in PowerPoint slides, in diagrams, and all these different ways to engineers that we should have this dimensional cube of stuff. And the engineers just looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. And then I spent um, half an hour building this thing, and I handed it to them, and they were like, oh yeah, of course, we can do this. Why are we guys? Of course we can do this. And so it shortcutted that whole thing, so then I was able to explain to them what my idea was. It also helps us to aspire. So this is the Toyota iCar uh, prototype that I built for Toyota. It's an AI-driven uh, robotic vehicle. Um, and we really went all out on the demo, or on the project, because we wanted it to inspire other people to think about future solutions for this type of, uh, of vehicle. But most importantly, most importantly out of all of that, making helps you maximize the rate of, of learning. I know that you've heard that in Silicon Valley we say fail fast, but I think a lot of people misunderstand what we mean by that. When we say fail fast, we don't mean kill the idea as fast as possible. What we mean is learn as much as you can without spending a lot of money to do so. Right? How many of you think Google Glass is a failure? It's not. It's just that penny. Remember how I said day 15 is at $163? That's what Google Glass was the first time it went out. Nobody ever thought that that was the final product. Google never thought that was the final product. They just wanted to learn a lot as quickly as possible. And by putting that into the marketplace, they learned a lot. Fast. Some people got punched in the face over it. It was great. Right? They learned so much. So what you want to do uh, and, uh, is, is learn quickly. And this is exactly what Tom Chi did. So Tom Chi was the head of prototyping X, the guys that brought you Google X, or Google Glass. And the way they prototyped it was not that they pulled out a bunch of technology and like, wired it up. No, what they did was they got a little tiny projector, a little piece of projector that you can buy for a couple, well, you know, 50 bucks or something like that. And they uh, got a paper clip and attached a paper clip on uh, Attached the motor to their head using a wire coat hanger that they screwed around their heads, um, and they had a little production phone. And that's how they prototyped it, as well as many other crazy different all duty type prototypes. And they quickly, quickly, quickly learned problems. For example, they were arguing for months over the color of the display, and there's a whole team that was convinced that red was the right color because science proves that red is the least damaging to your eyes. We need a red display. And then there's another condition that's like, no, that sounds terrible. We need a full color display. How? No. And this battle raged on for months. And it was getting to crucial, we have to make a decision time. Um, and so rather than, uh, 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 as Michael Gillen was talking about yesterday, making a decision before they had enough information, uh, which is very would be a costly mistake, he made this thing. And they showed a display of red, and they just showed, showed the, the full color. And guess what? The red was terrible. It didn't matter what the science said. It was the worst display possible. So they quickly abandoned that idea and opted for the full color instead. So by going through those different steps of discover, project, make, and launch, that's the last one, launch, you can get massive innovation exponential innovation, as opposed to the very comfortable, iterative type of innovation that we're so familiar with. <clears throat> All it takes is for you to shift your perspective. Pretty simple. As my good friend Pascal Finette says, your rate of growth equals the magnitude of challenge that you are willing to uh, take on and the amount of effort that you put into it. All of us can do this. Of course, in the bit where I said, you know, do or do not. There is no try. So, Christine's going to tell you a little bit about how we're going to do this today. Thank you. Table, that's great. 
If you feel like you need to move to sit with somebody else, why don't we do that now while Christine finishes with uh, finishing this up? Because what we're going to do today is um, come up with ideas of how to change, you know, massive, massive change. Yeah. Yes, and 